continuing on from our series, talking about the data of endurance, lab testing data, VO2 max, that side of things, what I thought I'd do is talk through a couple of the comparisons between graphs. So some of our relationships in this data, some plotting against each other, VO2 versus heart rate, ventilation's role in terms of total oxygen consumption, and show you a couple of things that are happening. They're really interesting relationships that we look at from a lab testing perspective. So without any further ado, let's get into it. Hey, welcome back to the channel. Nick here talking science of endurance and everything sports science in general. Thanks to everyone who has been subscribing to the channel. And if you haven't, please do consider hitting that big red button down below to keep update with the latest content. I think we're 11 subscribers away from two and a half thousand. So it'd be awesome if we could get there by the end of the year. And if you're watching and you're already a subscriber, one way that you can help continue to grow this channel is by hitting the share button down below. Pass this video on to someone that you might think is interested. Like I said, we only need 11 subscribers to get to that two and a half thousand mark and be absolutely unreal if we could get there as soon as possible. Also, head over to Instagram. Made a post just before, some different content over on Instagram. So at NJ underscore sports science down the bottom corner here. Head over there, some different content. You can directly message me. Had some great messages and conversations over the last few days. Plenty coming through. Interesting topics around sports science endurance and they're going to inform some videos. They're going to be coming up on the channel pretty soon. As I mentioned in the intro though, this is continuing on our series that have been going on at the moment and I've been leaving the playlist up there so you can go back and revisit the videos, but talking through lab testing data, what are some of the important metrics? How do we see things change? We've covered basically the acute responses aspect to, uh, to our performance. How does heart rate change? How does ventilation change, respiratory rate? What's our oxygen consumption doing? FeO2, how the percentage of oxygen we're actually using out of the air that's coming into the body. And what I thought I'd do today is follow on that um, some of the relationships I look at in a lab testing circumstance. So I'm going to bring it up on the screen here and talk through primarily two, uh, two other graphs that we do look at um, in the lab when I'm doing some testing. The first one being this ventilation versus VO2. This is a really interesting, um, interesting relationship. And I largely look at this when I'm trying to confirm some training zone information. I'm not going to go too much into uh, VT1, VT2 today, but largely for VT2, understanding uh, when that second ventilatory threshold is, which is commonly known as anaerobic threshold, lactate threshold, functional threshold, it's all the same thing. And, and in this circumstance, it's pretty clear that it's happening at this point here that I'm circling um, circling on the graph here. You see this exponential rise afterwards. That's a clear change in, in what's happening. So there's one of our VT thresholds, uh, which, is, which is actually the lactate threshold in this circumstance. Um, but in, in terms of what we are looking at, this is ventilation in relationship with VO2, so our oxygen consumption. What is our air intake versus our oxygen consumption telling us about this performance? And this really links in well with our FeO2 percentage, which if you have watched that video looking about how well we use the oxygen, talk about FeO2, it's all about how much we can use at the working muscle. And this graph kind of backs up that information. We saw in that FeO2 video, they haven't checked it out, I'll link it above down below in the description as well. Um, go check that one out because it's all about, as the test goes on, the muscle becomes saturated. We can't use physically any more oxygen than we already are. We just have to turn things over at a quicker rate. And what this graph is showing is this is showing really the point in which we're starting to get this disproportionate um, increase in ventilation. So we're breathing more for not necessarily any more effect. And we're just getting more and more air for, um, I guess, no, not massive amounts of oxygen consumption more. And really ventilation is kind of picking up for the sake of picking up. Body's trying to supply as much oxygen as we can, but the muscles aren't using it. And how we sort of interpret that is you have a look at the beginning of the test here or right up and till that sort of turning point here, things are linear. If I chopped out this top section of the graph, we'd have a linear increase in how much air we're intaking versus our oxygen consumption. So as ventilation is going up, we're breathing more, oxygen consumption is going up at a pretty consistent rate all through until about this point here. You can see it's pretty linear. There's a couple of sort of flat spots and lulls where it's, where it's pretty okay. But for the vast majority of this, for the first 14 and a half minutes of the test really, things are a linear progression. As ventilation is going up, so is VO2. So that's all happy days. What we then have after this point and why it really is that lactate threshold is we have this really sort of exponential rise in the graph. Things start happening a lot quicker. And if I go back to ventilation, we saw this same trend when we were just looking at air intake in general, we saw linear, linear, linear goes up, makes sense. Uh, exercise intensity is up there. We're starting to struggle to use the oxygen, which we saw the FeO2 graph, that percentage wasn't as good. So you have to get more air in for that same oxygen usage uh, overall or sliding present oxygen consumption. Um, 
we're also dumping in a whole bunch of air to try and combat that acidity of things like lactic acid, a bit of CO2 build up in the system as well. So it's a, it's a really interesting one for me to then sort of pinpoint when an athlete is just kind of breathing in more for the sake of breathing in and we're not actually using that oxygen. And the more dramatic this trend is, I mean, usually we might see this, quite, if this is quite linear throughout, I kind of look at it and go, there's always going to be an exponential portion to the end. But if it's quite linear throughout and not as pronounced as this, where it's that genuine sort of arcing uh, curve sort of structure across the whole graph and that, that clear change from about this point onwards, I go, okay, the, the athlete's using uh, using oxygen quite well relative to how much air they're breathing in. So that, that indicates a better efficiency of that whole process through the body. When I see this really pronounced, and even it is, could be a more dramatic to be sort of flatter to here and then come up, it really tells me at the top end that they're getting a lot of air in, but they can't use it. So we need to focus on that mitochondrial adaptation. We really need to target at high intensity how well can we use oxygen and turn over oxygen through the system, improve the rate of use of aerobic power. And that fundamentally comes down to the high intensity interval training as well, which we discussed in that FEO2 video. So that's the first one I, I really look at. And like I said, it, it helps me guide my process in terms of training zones, but I'll leave that for another uh, another day and another video where I talk about how I actually go about finding training zones off data uh, like this. If I move across to this other graph now, and this is probably the other important one that I really like to look at. Um, and it's one that I like to use uh, to describe to athletes why their garments, for example, can get a really accurate VO2 rating. Now, I've already done a video breaking this down uh, briefly before. I'll link it above down below. It was actually basically the video that helped kickstart this channel, got incredible amount of views on it, well over 125,000 views on that video. Go check it out if you haven't. Breaks down uh, what's happening. But fundamentally, that video in a summary here is this graph. It's Garmin's ability to be able to predict your VO2 fundamentally comes down to the relationship between oxygen consumption, so VO2, um, take in transport, utilize of oxygen. And you can see that on the y-axis here and your heart rate. So all it's doing is as long as you're getting nice, accurate heart rate data, if you're a runner, as long as you're getting good, accurate pace data, and if you're a cyclist, it's power. It's not cadence or speed, it's power on the bike that you need to be able to get a VO2 reading. What it does is it basically will plot out, in this circumstance, we've got oxygen consumption and we have heart rate information, great. Um, in Garmin's circumstance, it's got all your heart rate information, but instead of oxygen consumption, it'll plot it out as pace or power, um, put that as a graph, plot out all your intensities. And basically it's a linear progression when it matches it up with heart rate to exercise intensity. If I flick back to our heart rate graph, you can see here, a bit of a glitch there. You can see here as exercise intensity goes up, heart rate is a linear increase as exercise intensity goes up. So when we look at this, it's, well, if this is heart rate across the bottom in Garmin's circumstance, they got pace or power, we have this linear trend as well. So when we map it to oxygen consumption, really they're bringing in these numbers in terms of oxygen consumption based on your pace, based on what your heart rate is for that pace, based on your age, your gender, your height and your weight, all of those factors, puts it into a big algorithm and it basically spits out the ability to predict 100% VO2 max by solving this equation, this Y equals equation up here. I know it's a little small, um, but we do have this complex equation here. And you can see it's really accurate in terms of its predictability because we have an R squared value of 0 0.93. In this circumstance, in majority of cases, I very rarely see this number drop below 0 0.99, if anything. And if you don't really know what I'm talking about here, this is a correlation coefficient. So we're talking about how accurate, or I guess how close to this black line it, that's plotted perfectly here, which would be a, an exact increase in heart rate for an exact increase in equal increase in oxygen consumption the whole way through and intensity going up. Um, 0 0.9 is pretty much as close as you're going to get to perfect. 1.0 would be perfect, but no one's data is going to be exactly uh, identical. I mean, I've had as high as sort of 0 0.98, which is pretty good. Um, in terms of the, the close, uh, how close that relationship is, you can see all these blue data points that are our actual data sit very, very close to that predictive equation in the middle. So it, it's the type of thing that obviously Garmin, is, as long as it's got accurate inputs, it's going to be able to understand roughly what your VO2 max is, very close to about two to three mils per kilo per minute uh, variance between the lab testing and what you get on your watch, which for an estimate is an incredibly useful, um, useful look at what might be going on. A lot of athletes do sort of struggle um, when it comes to that estimate though, largely because their data isn't necessarily accurate. Maybe there's an issue with their chest, their chest strap. Um, taking wrist-based heart rate can sometimes be a bit of an issue and in getting inaccuracy. If your pace isn't reading well, you haven't got a proper connection to a satellite or you've got overcast conditions that are playing up, playing a bit of havoc with your data, that can all impact that Garmin's ability to estimate VO2. But fundamentally, it comes down to the, these progressions in physiology where it's heart rates going up for, for exercise intensity in a linear fashion. The relationship between VO2 and heart rate is a pretty much a linear correlation, and that correlation is exceptionally strong 
Garmin just inputs all of that information, what we know about physiology with some of your individual characteristics, bang, it's able to get a, a relative VO2 max pretty close to what we would expect in the lab. And even having a look at, um, even if I just go back here to, to my data, having a look at what my VO2 max was on the day, if I scroll down, if this is going to let me scroll down here, you can see my VO2 max at 59.1. This was obviously last year, but I, uh, I mean, similar time last year, looking at my Garmin's VO2 max, I, I believe it's at about 58 uh, mils per kilo per minute. So that, that, that sort of goes to show and proves that Garmin can do a reasonable job as long as the data is accurate at estimating VO2 max because of our basic concepts in terms of physiology. So as I said at the beginning, that is a, those are just a couple of the graphs that I look at in terms of relationships between variables. What is happening with our oxygen consumption versus our ventilation and how do those two interact throughout? Where do we see some, some significant change in air intake, but we're not really seeing a significant change in oxygen consumption. That tells us a bit about where to train the athlete into physio physiological characteristics. And then also the VO2 and heart rate side of things. I check that just to make sure I've got nice accurate data because that should be a nice tight correlation as well. But it's also a good one to then compare and explain to athletes and coaches why their Garmin has actually done a reasonable job or, or why maybe their Garmin is significantly out as well. So if you have any questions about either of those graphs or any of the data we've been covering in this little series, leave them in the comments down below. Always happy to help and, and fill in the details there, answer your questions. If you have any suggestions for topics, head over to Instagram at NJ underscore sports science. Send in some questions about the data or things you'd like to see, um, topics on the channel you'd like me to cover in a future video. Always happy to help and make specific content direct to the audience and what you guys want to see. As I mentioned at the beginning, continue to subscribe to the channel. Keep passing the videos on and sharing with people you might be interested in. We're very close to 2,500. As I mentioned, 11 away. Um, while I'm doing this video, we may have even ticked over 10 away from 2,500. So if everyone on uh, who watches this shared it with one person and, and everyone subscribed, we'd be well, over through the, well and truly over that benchmark in no time. But all it takes is sort of 10 or 11 people to jump on we hit two and a half thousand. We continue to grow this channel as best we can and we move towards the next benchmark after that. So appreciate you joining in and getting involved in the discussion on this series. Been enjoying some of the positive feedback so far, enjoying making these videos and, and taking you through the data. Hopefully you got something out of it. Uh, I'm going to leave it there for today. Looking forward to the next video in the series and we'll see you in the next one.